that we can do besides just say, I'm a Christian. There's a lot more work to be done. But the least I can do is surrender my life to Him and say, Lord, here it is. Here's all of me. Amen. For all that He's done for us. Well, I want to tell you tonight as you turn to Isaiah chapter 65 that it's not an easy thing for me to be seven days into December and not have a Christmas lesson tonight. We're still in Isaiah, but I had made a commitment that we would finish this uh, book by the uh, end of the year, and in order to do that, we need tonight and one more, and uh, the Lord willing, we'll wrap this year and a half long study up of Isaiah, and we'll be able to kind of go in a little new direction here after the first of the year. So we're going to go tonight to the 65th chapter next to the last chapter of the book of Isaiah. And it might seem strange to you when I tell you that though we're this far back in the Old Testament, and though we're in Isaiah, not in the New Testament, not in Revelation, though we'll be looking in Revelation tonight, but to be this far back in the Old Testament and spend this lesson talking predominantly about the millennial reign, the 1,000-year millennial reign, and then the great end time, amen, the final end, if you will, that's where we're going to be because that's what Isaiah describes for us and that's what he talks to us about in this 65th chapter, predominantly beginning with verse 17 of this chapter. Now let me just tell you that in the verses that lead up to verse 17, the Lord is basically, uh, or uh, Isaiah is basically talking to us about how the Lord will one day turn to the Gentiles because as we know, His own rejected Him and received Him not. For example, if you look at the first verse in chapter 65, it says, I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. And what that's a reference to is the Lord turning to the Gentiles, those that had not sought Him, those that were not His own, those that had not been called by His name. Uh, he turned to them, and they turned to Him, and all because His own people would reject Him. Of course, we're in a Messianic chapter again here in the book of Isaiah. So, when you read those verses that lead up to verse 17, that's predominantly what Isaiah is talking about. The, uh, the Lord turning to a people that had not sought Him and the judgment of those that had turned against Him. But when we come to this 17th verse, and we're going to read together here verse 17 through 20, you know these words, you've heard these words. They're very familiar words for you, and this is how they read. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mine. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people." And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled or hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. Now you've heard similar words to that already in the book of Isaiah. And we read similar words to that also in other places that we'll look in the Scripture tonight. It's not the first time that Isaiah has prophesied about a future day of great promise and blessing for the people of the Lord. Though he starts off saying what I said a moment ago about the Gentiles turning to him, his own people rejecting him, he then moves on to say, but even though his own people have rejected him, he will have a remnant and he will restore through a remnant. But then we come to this great promise here, 
predominantly speaking, of a thousand-year millennial reign. You have to go all the way back to the 11th chapter of Isaiah to hear some of the description that he gives about this day. When you go back to chapter 11 and you start looking at verse 6, you remember these words, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play in the hole of the asp or the poisonous snake. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now that's all the way back in the 11th chapter. Now we are in the 65th chapter and Isaiah is still talking about this great, blessed, glorious day that is to come to those who put their trust and confidence in the Lord. Now let's, let's do something tonight. Let's try to clarify something. Let's try, to, let's try to help understand something here. When you talk about end time events, you, it can be very difficult to harmonize various passages that talk about end time events. It can be hard to harmonize. In other words, what is the difference in the end times? What is the difference in the thousand year millennial reign uh, versus or in comparison to or in contrast to that time when the holy city, New Jeru Jerusalem, shall come down out of heaven and sit upon the earth? What is the difference in all of these times? Well, let me try to help us harmonize that by acknowledging the fact that there are in the scripture, there are given to us really three worlds or three ages of time. There are really three ages of time that are described for us in the Word of God. The first one is the present time. The first one is, in other words, ordinary human life as we know it. As has been from Adam and Eve all the way to the present time. That is what we're familiar with. This is what we know. And in this present time, we know that it is a time checkered by sin and holiness, by happiness and misery, by sorrow and rejoicing. How many of you know there are ups and there are downs? There are good days and there are bad days. There are days of victories and there are days of failure. The Bible lays that out for us as, as the time in which we're living. The second time, or age if you will, that's referred to in the scripture is the millennial age or the 1,000 year millennial reign as you have heard it described. Isaiah describes it here as a time when there shall be no more fence and infant of days. What does that mean? Well, we'll look at that here in a moment. It's a time when the conflict of struggle between Man and nature, between man and animal kingdom, between good and evil will be subdued and suppressed. In that 1,000 year millennial reign, the Bible tells us, and we'll read tonight, that the devil will be locked up for a thousand years. He will not be able to get out and do any harm during that 1,000 year millennial reign. But life will still go on in the earth. It won't go on with rebellion and rejection and hatred being manifest and persecution of the saints of God as we know it now, but life will go on. For example, there are descriptions in the Bible of these times. There are descriptions that talk about how uh, nations will come in and come out of the holy city. There are times that 
are described as, and Isaiah refers to it here, as when someone dies at a hundred years of age, they will be considered an infant. But notice in that that there will still be people dying. And there will still be people being born during the 1,000 year millennial reign. It will be a time of peace without danger. But the seeds of iniquity and the seeds of evil are still here. They're just suppressed. The devil is locked up. After a 1,000 years, he'll be loosed again. And there'll be a right and ready rebellion that occurs. And the Lord will take care of that uprising. And when the Lord takes care of it then, that will usher in the third state or third age. And that is the final state when the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, shall descend out of heaven and come down upon this earth. Death itself will be destroyed. Destroyed, sin will be no more. There will be no more tears, for they will all be wiped from our eyes, and the former things will have passed away. So, in the Word of God, you have the present age, you have the age to come known as the millennial reign, and then you have the final age to come, which is the great and glorious time when death shall be swallowed up in victory. Amen. That helps us to get a little bit of a grasp on what Isaiah is talking about and the time frame that he's talking about. The thing about the Old Testament and the Old Testament prophets is that many of them saw this future time, this future day that God would would make all things right. But they did not see these times as distinctly marked or separated. So therefore, oftentimes, when you hear an Isaiah or a prophet, uh, Hosea, for example, speak of the future glorious day, Oftentimes, there are elements of the 1,000-year millennial reign as well as the final state because they didn't have them distinctly marked. One man did have them distinctly marked and gave it to us, and he was John the Revelator. And John the Revelator described this time this way in the 20th chapter of Revelation, beginning with with verse 1. He says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. A thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. After that, he must be loosed for a season. Now, Isaiah saw these great times coming, but he didn't see the distinct period of a thousand years here and then the final state beyond that. But John did see that. John said there's going to be a thousand year reign. At the end of that thousand years, he's going to be loosed again, and then comes the final glorious state. When you drop down in that same chapter of Revelation at verse 7, it says this, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, And compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, that would be Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the... Now now then, we're in the final state. The devil that deceived them, he was locked up a thousand years. He got out. He caused all this trouble. But now then, in verse 10, 
He that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. And that's the final state when the new Jerusalem shall come down out of heaven and there'll be no more death and there'll be no more tears for the Lord shall wipe away the tears from our eyes and thank God for the prophecy and the promise of this glorious time. Isn't it amazing that all the way back, hundreds of years back in the Old Testament, Isaiah's talking about this day. It still hasn't happened yet. And Isaiah saw it way back there and prophesied about this time. So, here's kind of the chronology as we understand it in the Word of the Lord. We're living this life as pilgrims down here now. We're, we're having good days and bad days, good years and bad years, and getting older all the time. And it's not getting a whole lot better, is it? But the day's going to come when the trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the air, to meet the Lord, and we're going to go be with the Lord. And sometime after that, there's going to be upon this earth A thousand years of peace for the Lord himself will seal the devil up and all of his influence. And you say, why has he got to be that way, Pastor? Well, you have to take that up with the Lord. That's his choice. That's his decision. But he chooses for it to be that way. And during that thousand year millennial reign, we get to have a good time. We get, for example, to take part in that marriage supper of the Lamb that you've read about so often. It's going to be a glorious time for the saints of God. And during that thousand years, things will be different upon this earth. People will be born, people will die, but the longevity of life, there'll be a lot of changes. There'll be changes in the animal kingdom, as we see. Um, Even the snake is going to be happy to eat the dust of the field. No more, no more uh, preying on animals. But it's going to be a glorious time. But it won't last forever like that. After the thousand years, the devil's let out again. He goes and gathers up all the enemies of God all over the world to try to come and destroy Jerusalem. And God steps in and intervenes and destroys them and finally, once and for all, takes the devil and his false prophet and he throws them into hell forever and ever. And that is the final state. So you have these three periods of time. That are referred to in the scripture. Now in this 65th chapter of Isaiah. Predominantly, mostly what Isaiah is referring to. I don't think he knew. I don't think he understood all the intricacies and details of it. But mostly what he's referring to is the 1,000 year millennial reign, though there are elements in it of the final state. For example, look at uh, verse 17 again. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Now, that happens to be the final state. That happens to be that third and final state. But then Isaiah goes on after that and describes elements of the 1,000 year millennial reign. So so the Old Testament prophets, they saw it, but it just kind of all got jumbled up together. John the Revelator comes along and says, let me tell you how this is going to work. A thousand years loosed, the Lord's going to take over, and the final state's ushered in, and the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. Thank God for the revelation of his word. Amen. Peter saw this day, this final day, in 2 Peter chapter 3. In verse 7 it says, But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 
But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That is Peter referring to the final state of glory and blessedness. Blessedness. Now, we go back to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21 verse 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Hallelujah. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Amen. Now that's John the Revelator referring to the final state. The final state. And Isaiah starts off here referring to the final state. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Praise the Lord. When we come to verse 20, the description begins to have more of the elements of the thousand-year millennial reign than the final state. For example, look at verse 20. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. Isn't that interesting? I know that's not I know he's not referring to the final state because you're going to have people dying and you're going to have people being younger and people being older and we know in the final state there's not any of that right but that's what he says here so during the 1000 year millennial reign the world is not without death though life will change drastically life during the 1,000 year millennial reign, will not be without sorrow. How about that for a flipping you upside down in what you've always heard? There'll be sorrow. I mean, if there's going to be death, there's going to be sorrow. So that's what he begins to talk about here in the 20th verse. References to a time when there won't be any death, there won't be any sorrow, There won't be any tears or references to the final state. Now, he says in verse 20, There shall be no more thence an infant of days. What in the world does that sentence mean? Well, it means that death will no more break off the life that is just beginning to bloom. Somebody that's a hundred years old will be looked upon and viewed as a child. That's what he's saying. That's how different it's going to be. Life is going to be during the millennial reign. The youth will reach a hundred. And one who dies when he is a hundred will be regarded as a child. Boy, I could go for that. I think I could. I don't know, it's bad as it's getting around here, down here. I don't know, I don't know that you want to stay around much longer, right? But that's what that's how he describes this. He also says, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. What does that mean? Well, that simply means that the elderly shall live their full lives and attain to longevity, much like it was early in 
the Old Testament. Much like it was then. But now notice something else he says here. And you didn't know this, did you? You didn't know there would be any sinners in the 1,000 year millennial reign. But there will be. He says right here in this verse, the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. So what's remarkable about Isaiah's description here of this future day that we have come to know as the 1,000 year millennial reign, what's remarkable about it is that maybe you thought there wouldn't be death or you thought there wouldn't be sin or you thought there wouldn't be sorrow, but there will be during that time. It's just that the influence of the devil to cause any kind of rebellion or uprising or persecution against the people of God will not exist. It will not be tolerated. For the Lord will rule and reign in righteousness during that 1,000 year millennial reign. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like you disciplining your child and, and, Nowadays it's a time out, I get it. Nowadays it's a go in the corner, but, but it wasn't that way when I was growing up. It was a switch from the fence row, or it was a belt out of the closet. But whatever it is, whether it's a time out, whether it's in the corner, whatever it is, you can, you can do that, but I guarantee you it's still there. It's still there. And given half a chance, they'll do it again. They'll do it again. Because what you've just done is you've just suppressed it. That's all you've done. You've just suppressed it. We hope in that process that we're teaching a lesson and that they get it up here. But it's been suppressed. We didn't, we didn't make it not exist. We just kept it tamped down. And during the 1,000 year millennial reign, all the evil and wickedness is just going to be suppressed and tamped down. And the devil's not going to be free to rule and reign. And his, his demonic power's not going to be free to go about influencing others to cause all kind of uprising. That's not going to be allowed during the 1,000 year millennial reign. But it's still there. And as soon as he's released, it'll come to the surface again. And that's what he's referring to here when he says the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed they'll still be sinners during the 1000 year millennial reign if you can believe that so during the millennial reign verse 21 and 22 it says they shall build houses and in, and he's talking about his people now he's talking about the holy people the people of god they shall build houses and inhabit them they shall plant vineyards and eat of the fruit of them they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. In other words, there won't be this thing of, the, of my people working and planting and building and some enemy coming in and taking it from them and depriving them of the work of their hands. That won't happen during the thousand year reign. My people shall be blessed, he says. And my people shall enjoy the work of their hands. They'll plant and they'll eat out of their own gardens. And what they construct will be theirs. And nobody's going to come along as now and take that away from them. And he says in verse 22, And as the days of a tree are the days of my people. You know as well as I do in the scripture that trees are always looked upon as, as uh, having longevity. In fact... There are trees in the Holy Land right now that they say were there. Jess, I'm sure, seen some of those that were there when Jesus walked among them. Still there, still growing. Trees endure for hundreds, if not thousands of years. The cedars of Lebanon, the oaks of Bashan were known to have antiquity of centuries. And this is what the Lord is referring to. This is how life will be largely altered during that great and glorious day. So, so what, what is it that the Lord is saying through Isaiah the prophet here from verse 17 and following? The Lord is really pronouncing blessing upon his people. 
and that there is a day coming. And guess who that day comes through? It comes through the Messiah, the anointed one, his servant, the one who was born in Bethlehem's stable 2,000 years ago that we're getting ready to celebrate here in a few days. He's the one through whom all, through which all of this will come, this great blessing. You come to verse 24, and it shall come to pass. That before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. That's the Lord saying, in that day, I'll already know what they need. And before they even really have the need to say it, I'll be already meeting their need and taking care of them. Somebody said, God is always more ready to hear than we are to pray. I believe that, don't you? Always more ready to hear than we are to pray. And he will be prompt to answer almost before they're ever uttered. And it will be a time. And you say, how will that be? Well, it will be a time when the people of God will be in such harmony with the will of God that their prayers, therefore, will be acceptable prayers. You know, all our prayers aren't acceptable prayers right now, folks. Just because you say, I prayed, doesn't mean that was an acceptable prayer. I believe it was James who said we can ask amiss and we can ask to heap upon ourselves. Our prayers aren't always in perfect harmony with the will of God right now. You keep praying and you let the Lord show you. Don't use that as, as an excuse not to pray. But the fact remains we ask amiss sometimes. But not then. Our will will be in such harmony with His will. That whatever we ask, before we can get it spoken, he's ready to answer it. And he will. Hallelujah. In verse 25, we'll wrap it up right here. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. And the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And the dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy. In all my holy mountain saith the Lord. In other words, when he says that dust will be the serpent's meat. What he's saying is the serpent will be no more harmful. But the serpent will be harmless in that he will not prey upon beasts and birds and reptiles, but will be content with the food assigned to him. Won't that be great? And they shall not hurt nor destroy And we don't regard, by the way, that phrase, that statement to only refer to the animal kingdom. But it means there will be no violence of any kind done by man or beast in this period, this happy millennial reign period that Isaiah mostly refers to here in the 65th chapter. Though again, there are a couple of little elements of the final kingdom there, the new heaven and the, earth, and the new earth. I get, I get real excited about it all, church, because I'm going to get to be in both of those times. I'm going to get to be in the 1,000 year with the Lord during the 1,000 year millennial reign, and then I know I'm going to be in that final state. Amen. And they haven't happened yet, but they're coming. They're coming. Right now, we're still in that first phase that first age of life as we know it now but oh it's coming soon I believe it's coming soon and uh, I I hope tonight has been it's obviously a different kind of study when you're talking about such a future day and time yet we're looking at it way back in the Old Testament under the prophet Isaiah but it was Isaiah who spoke of it and who prophesied it under the anointing and inspiration of the Lord And I am thankful, aren't you? I'm thankful. Amen. Stand with me, if you will. Forgot my watch, so I had to bring the phone tonight and keep up with the time. And Deef and Durfer back there took the time off the TV. I didn't know what time it was. Have I gone 30 minutes? Have I gone 45 minutes? Can I go longer? (laughs) No, we're going to let you go tonight. Please remember all of our sick people, folks. We really do have a lot of folks that are sick. Sister Lowry's another that we want to remember in our prayers. Yes. Oh, 
Okay. All right. Remember that. Remember that, if you will, and be in prayer for Brother Boot Hickman. And the Lord will help us. I believe that, don't you? Yes. 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 Norma Emery fell and uh, messed her shoulder up, right? Her, her wrist. Okay. Broken wrist. I thought it was shoulder Sunday night. Yes, Donna's had surgery. Donna has about, had, they had to put about eight or nine screws and a plate in her wrist and arm. So that's a pretty extensive break right there. And she, she needs our prayer as well. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's remember her. We'll pray for these people as we pray this final prayer here and thank the Lord also for this service tonight. Can we do that, dear Heavenly Father? In Jesus' name, we, we do thank you, Lord, tonight for the opportunity to have spent time in your word and learning and growing and developing in faith. And Lord, we thank you for what you've promised to us and given to us through your holy word. And as we close this service tonight, Lord, we do so in thanksgiving. We do, all, do also, Lord, being mindful of those who need our prayers. And these additional requests that have been shared here tonight, reach out, I pray, and minister in the name of the Lord, and we will give thanks to you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. God